Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Every week I have the wonderful privilege of, of uh, bringing to you men and women who are following the grace of God, the leading of the Holy Spirit, and a variety of other ways that God gets their attention. Not only did they come to a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ, but they came all the way home to the Catholic Church. A lot of them, that was the last thing they expected. So they're here to tell their story. I'm uh, pleased to have as a guest tonight, Kevin O'Brien. You may have seen him a couple of other times on EWTN. He's got some stuff coming up. You want to keep an eye out for that name. Kevin is a former atheist. He's here to tell his story. But before I turn it over to Kevin, I want to remind you that you're an important part of this program. So if you'd like to call later with a question for Kevin, you can do so at 1-800-221-9460. Outside North America, 205-271-2980. Or you can send us an email at journeyhome at EWTN.com. Welcome back, Kevin. You were just sitting here a couple hours ago. Yes. Of course, the audience doesn't know they that. They don't know that. But we know that. Yeah. You interviewed me earlier today, but it wasn't really me. That's right. That's the mystery. That's right. In fact, some of you were, who've maybe been fans of the EWTN, uh, the Journey Home for a while, may have noticed in the past that you were scheduled at least once before, oh, if not right. twice yeah. before <laughs> things happened. But you're here not just to do the Journey Home. You've done a few other things while you're here. And tell the audience what you and I did just a couple hours ago. Just a couple hours ago, in celebration of the Pauline year, I was St. Paul, and you interviewed the most famous convert to the Catholic Church, Paul of Tarsus. So I got to be uh, a guest, and I got to be St. Paul, which I am on stage many times uh, in this day and age, playing in the journey of St. Paul, the show that we have touring, but I got to be St. Paul today with you, and that was a real treat. What's the name of your tour group again? Well, the, our company is called the Theater of the Word Incorporated, and that's going to be the name of a series that I'll be hosting on EWTN. And we, we call it the theater of the word because John Paul, when he was Karol Wojtyla, had the theater of the word in Nazi-occupied Poland. But we add incorporated because the word incorporated means the word become flesh. Yeah. And our philosophy is, <laughs> as the good. word became flesh and dwelt among us, so we as actors and writers and producers take words on the printed page and flesh them out in dramatic performance. And our most popular show this year has been The Journey of St. Paul, where we with only four actors in about an hour, an hour and 15 minutes, we tell the whole story of Paul's life and include some of his best writings. And then we did a little bit of that today, just yeah. a, a little while ago. Well, in fact, I, I want the audience to see a little clip, and I will say that I really enjoyed that time. Uh, we were using a bit of a script, of course, but uh, you did such a fine job. I really felt like I was, I wanted to stop and ask you other questions <laughs> because you did such a fine job. Let's let the audience see a little clip from this afternoon's taping. Well, for example, he told us that the Eucharist is just a symbol and that all right. early Christians, like St. Paul, felt the same way. Is that true? <laughs> Did you believe the Eucharist was just a symbol? We spoke just a moment ago of what the apostles have passed on. Well, I now pass on to you what I myself received 2,000 years ago, and this is central to all the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread and giving thanks, broke and said, this is my body, which shall be given up for you. Do this in memory of me. In like manner also the chalice, after he had supped, saying, this chalice is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as often as ye shall drink, in memory of me. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, very good. That Thank was excellent, well, excellent. So audience, keep your eye on EWTN's schedule. I'm not sure when we will broadcast that yet as a Journey on Home episode, but that's when it will be, so be broadcast. But that was a real enjoyment. A joy to do that with you this afternoon, Kevin. And it's a real blessing to be able to travel the country portraying St. Paul. That's, that's an unbelievable experience. It really is amazing. You know, I, I know from my own experience doing theater that when you're, you're learning the parts of a character, it's more than learning the lines. You're trying to understand. You're trying to be that character, understand that. And my guess is 
learning St. Paul was an amazing experience for you yourself. Well, and deciding what to put in the script was the first <laughs> challenge because there's so much yeah. good material there. How do you pick out enough to fit in an hour or an hour and a half worth of uh, performance? So that was the first challenge, trying to make sense of how would Paul describe his life? Because we, we tell our story as a kind of flashback. We begin with Acts 25, where he is in Caesarea, and he's called uh, to tell his story to King Agrippa and Bernice. And so he begins to tell it, and then in flashback we see the famous conversion, we see the persecutions, we see his miracles, and we get to hear his greatest writings along the way. But I will say that I thought I kind of understood St. Paul. The more I play him, the more I think I understand him. Uh, and, you know, he is such an amazing character because not only does he have this great zeal and love for God, but his hymn to love from 1 Corinthians is some of the most, the most beautiful writing that's ever been, been put on, the, on paper. And so he covers such a vast spectrum from his, his stern armor of God's speech to this wonderful hymn to love. So we include all of that and try to really bring it home to the audience uh, as we perform. I almost put you on the spot today when we were filming the program because as I mentioned to the audience, it got to the point where I, I, it was really great. I'm, I'm, <laughs> just, I'm sitting here with St. Paul. And after you did that, Apart from 1 Corinthians, you know, there are some biblical scholars out there that say Paul didn't write that. He was just quoting a hymn, early Christian hymn. I wanted to say, no, Paul, did you write that? Or was that it? <laughs> I would have <laughs> said <laughs> yes. I would have said yes, I wrote it. And I wrote stuff just as good as that, That's too, great. because the Holy Spirit was with me. That's what I would have said. Well, but you're here tonight for your story, and, uh, and you do have a story. So I usually ask the guests to take a long step back and begin at the beginning and give us a little snippet of your early spiritual journey. I was baptized, we went to church a bit, I went to a Lutheran grade school, my parents were nominally Christian. Really we didn't practice it much, I didn't hear it much, it wasn't really modeled for me, but I loved the stories. At age nine or 10, that young, we were watching TV one night and I saw Madeline Murray O'Hare, the famous atheist. She was being interviewed in a kind of conf confrontational Donahue style where people in the audience, the studio audience, were asking her questions. And they were being brutal with her because in those days, mm. you didn't hear people talk about being atheists. It was a scandal. These days, it's a fad. In those days, it wasn't. Yeah. And as a young kid, everything she said clicked with me. And I thought, she's right. This is all a myth. This is this whole religion thing is a way for people in power to control those who are out of power. This whole authority issue is a scam. And I became, as a young child, an atheist. And I was a vocal atheist and remained an atheist throughout most of my teenage years. But the thing that began to change me was drama and being on stage. Mm -hmm. I will well, let me ask first before you get there, did, was your family supportive of your decision? What, or did you keep it to yourself? I was a character, you know. I was oh, an only okay, child, okay. and I was always doing theatrical things. Okay. I was imitating various people. I would tell <laughs> funny stories. I would sing songs. And so, you know, Kevin's an atheist now. Well, that's part of who he is. Okay. He's just, you know, sort of the showman. And um, okay. it's a bit uh, like Rich Little not really remembering which voice was his in the first place, you know what I mean? Well, <laughs> <laughs> kind of like that, yeah, it's kind of like that. Okay. And then they're saying, is this the real Kevin? Is this what, the real yeah, Kevin? Yeah, okay. Well, they, they, they were permissive. They let me be, they right. let me say what I want to say and believe what I want to believe. And, and it meant a lot to me. I mean, I was pretty strident about it. And in fact, my heart goes out to atheists of goodwill. And I don't think there are as many of those as there used to be. Mm. Most of the atheists this day and age are atheists without any real courage. And they are atheists who haven't thought it through much and they've just jumped on the bandwagon. The atheists that my heart goes out to are the ones who say, this is bunk and it's humbug and I want to find the truth and I want to broadcast the truth to as many people as I can. Because that attitude is the attitude that if they follow it will lead them to the gospel. And if they broadcast the truth, well, God is truth. I didn't know that at the time, but I eventually discovered that through a very long and circuitous journey. I will say, as difficult as I must have been to live with as a teenager, 
uh, uh, talking about my atheist beliefs and, and making fun of people who had faith. Everything came very easy to me as a high school student. I did well in school. I figured out the system and I worked the system. I figured out how to be popular by doing theater and by doing what I wanted because I wasn't a jock and I wasn't a nerd, but I kind of worked the system and figured it out. And by the time I got out of high school, I thought I've got it made. I know everything. I'm on top of this. The other strange thing about being an atheist, Marcus, when you're an atheist, you're convinced that the rest of the world is awash in superstitious religious belief. After I became a Christian many years later, I look around and I say, where are all the Christians? Where are all these people of faith? When you're an atheist, you really have a kind of persecution complex mm. and you really think that everybody is foolish and it's up to you to, to, to get them out of this. And I felt that way. But when I started doing drama seriously, uh, I was blessed with a very good director who was a stern taskmaster and he demanded everything of his cast. We had to know the lines word for word before the first rehearsal. We had to know them automatically so they just came out of us. We would do musicals. We had to sing and move and, and he taught us how to sing from the diaphragm. So suddenly I was confronted with something that was physically challenging, that was intellectually challenging from learning the lines and studying the roles I was playing, and emotionally challenging because it required me to show forth my emotions on stage. And the thing that frustrated me more than anything else was I couldn't make it happen. I could do all the work and all the preparation, and then in rehearsal or in performance, I had to abandon it. I had to, in a sense, lose my life to find it or lose my craft to find it. And if the cast and I were not inspired in some way on stage, we could do everything we had practiced and it would be lifeless, kind of like a mm. flat tire. Mm. So at that point I began to say to myself, I am having some sort of an experience of something beyond me <laughs> and maybe this selfish, overblown uh, character that I was is a little wrong. I called this thing the creative spirit because George Bernard Shaw, the Irish playwright, talked of the life force or the life spirit. So not wanting to really buy into the Christian thing, I said, well, maybe there is a spiritual realm and maybe there is something that I have to open myself up to and without which I cannot create a good dramatic performance. So that was really the beginning of what eventually brought me into the church. You made a step then from atheism to agnosticism, essentially. Well, I would say kind of a vague spirituality, a, a vague spiritualism, because I did believe in this spirit that I had tangible evidence of. Hmm. I would call it the Holy Spirit, or at least graces from the Holy Spirit that enable as people in any creative endeavor to do what they do because you can have all the perspiration you, you can apply but without that little spark of inspiration nothing will happen. You know, the increase is mine, saith the Lord. We can't make these things grow on our own. It really is beyond us. Mm -hmm. So I did become spiritualistic and so much so that I began reading Carl Jung who was the uh, <laughs> dis disciple of Sigmund Freud. And um, for some strange reason, I read everything oh, Jung wrote. He wrote, you know, probably 30, 40 volumes of material. What I loved about Jung was Jung was a spiritualist. Yeah. Jung was in fact, I would say a Gnostic is how I would term him these days. But he was reacting against Sigmund Freud, who said that we are nothing more than our neuroses mm. and we are nothing more than our most base desires. And Jung said, no, we have a spiritual component. He didn't quite get it right. Jung was pretty goofy in many ways. But for a long time I read him and for a long time I had the sense that here's a man who's plugged into something. Mm. Here's a man who studies dreams. I began to keep journals of my dreams. Mm. And um, here is something that was feeding my, my hunger for a religious experience. But I will back up and say this. People who are watching, who know actors or who are actors, who, 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 are, who are in the theatrical or cinematic profession know, actors are strange people. 
<laughs> we, we are emotionally insecure. We tend to be very uh, childish. We tend to be very self-centered. But even actors who are secular, and almost all of them are, there are very few Christian actors, very few Catholic actors, mm. even actors who are secular have an intense devotional nature. They apply it to their craft. Mm. Because the code is when you're on stage, you sacrifice yourself. If your partner on stage forgets his lines, you don't point it out. You do what it takes to make the show keep going. Even if you sacrifice your own favorite monologue and you have to jump three pages ahead, you do it because the show must go on. If you're sick, if you can hardly stand up, you will go on stage because the show must go on. Actors in the midst of all of their uh, concerns about their career and wanting to be famous, in spite of that, they have in their hearts this, this hope of being able to give themselves over entirely to a dramatic role, even if it's the spear carrier who's the third guard from the left. So even as an actor, I had a sense that what we were doing was in some sense religious and sacrificial. Because if you think about the dramatic arts, what we do is we take printed words, we flesh them out on stage, and if we do it well, there is a kind of communion that happens mm -hmm. in the cast and then also in the audience. And there is, there is a tangible feeling that people get if a show is very good and it really impresses them and, and knocks them out. And you have to live in this tight-knit community, you and your cast. You have to really be uh, together and working and sharing with one another. There are many ele elements mm -hmm. of it that are religious and that mimic the church. So I had that, and I loved that. And I had a call. It was a vocation. I would call it a minor vocation. It's not like marriage or the priesthood, but it is a vocation. It, it's a working vocation. And I knew it was a vocation because I was not happy doing anything else and I could not hold down a real job. That's a great sign that you're called to do something. It reminds me of uh, when uh, uh, in that, one of those great old um, Laurel and Hardy movies, I think it was, when they're lined up for the Foreign Legion and they want a, a volunteer. Well, they volunteered because everybody else stepped backwards. Yes. You know, I mean, that was, there you are. I mean, you've tried everything else. But I want to comment a little bit on what something you said, though. This, this, this devotional giving of yourself that is in the artistic. Is that also what, for many who do not have a trustworthy guide, therefore, that's why many artistic types are very vulnerable to getting drawn into other lifestyles. Oh, I think so. Because they give themselves completely. That's exactly right. That, and it's, it, you're in a very vulnerable position when you're an actor. Uh, on stage, you have to trust your director. If he tells you to do something that sounds crazy, you've still got to do it. And uh, actors are always in this vulnerable position in their real lives. People take advantage of actors right and left. Most, mm -hmm. most college graduate programs for acting uh, are, are nothing more than mind games from the beginning to the end. Mm -hmm. There's, it's really a, a sad thing, the way actors are treated in this culture and the way they starve and have to go sort of live hand to mouth in order to ply their craft. So, yeah. That's, so you have this vocation. I have this vocation. A vocation that I didn't really call a right. vocation, a vocation that I, I didn't know that it went beyond just loving to do theatrical performance. And I was reading Jung and I was a spiritualist. And then I got married and we had kids. And suddenly <laughs> my whole life changed. And suddenly I realized this career thing that I was pursuing so intensely was not nearly as important as these kids. And suddenly here were these creatures that I loved with all of my heart in a way that I could never have imagined and in a way that I couldn't plan for or stop. And my wife at the same time. And suddenly I began to think, what's going on here?